Conceptual Knowledge What do you think of when we talk about visual art? You might remember a painting of a landscape, a portrait of a well figure, a still art fruit bowl, an impressive sculpture, an outstanding photorealistic drawing, or a well-composed photograph. For most people, art must be clear in what it is representing and we do react with awe and wonder when an artist is able to capture the beauty of the natural and maybe even engineered world. So, how do you feel about cubism, where objects and scenes are reduced into weird geometric shapes? The seemingly random stripes and dots of abstract expressionism? The nightmarish landscapes of surrealism? Do they violate your assumptions that art should actually represent things? Okay, you hate it. Let's take it to the other end. In conceptual art, it doesn't matter as much what the final artwork is. What's crucial is the idea behind it. Belgian surrealist René Magritte painted the smoking pipe subtitled This is not a pipe in the 1929 work entitled The Treachery of Images. American conceptual artist Joseph Kosu's 1965 piece One and Three Chairs puts together a chair, its life-size photograph duplicate, and the dictionary definition of a chair. You want art that represents reality? Here's art that's as real as it gets. You want objects? You get objects. But these artists have a point. A picture of a pipe is not a pipe, but a visual depiction of it. A definition of a chair specifies its build and purpose, but you can't sit on the definition. And that's what conceptual knowledge is. It helps us identify things, whether they're in 3D space, in pictures or media, in our imaginations, or in our conversations. They're representations of the real world which are then organized in our heads, so we can make sense of a world filled with far too many objects to count. Conceptual knowledge involves categorizing concepts. Look around you and briefly fixate on one object at a time. Quickly try to say what it is and what it's used for. You'd notice that you are able to do this very quickly, and hopefully other people close to you aren't asking why you're yelling the names of random objects. What helps you do this is conceptual knowledge, or your understanding of what things are called, what things share the same name, what you think their properties or functions are, and what other things are related to them. Each thing in your conceptual knowledge library is called a concept, a mental representation of an individual object or a class of objects, including defining characteristics or properties. Think of them as nouns. They can be concrete, like cat, the titanic, vegetable, pencil, or abstract, love, values, justice, constitutional democracy. When I ask you to give examples of things that belong to a concept, the set of the things you can think of, or all the possible examples that meet the concept definition, is a category. German Shepherd, Siberian Husky, and Labrador Retriever are all part of the same category that meet the criteria of the concept dog. Fur, leg, scale, good. Meanwhile, fair electoral processes, a responsive government, protected civil liberties, and active engagement of citizenry through a conducive political culture and full political participation mark a full democracy, which the Philippines aspires and is advertised to be. Simply, concepts are the definition, categories are the examples of that concept. Concepts can be categorized and organized in different ways. There are many theories and approaches that try to explain how we categorize things. We're going to look at four basic approaches that gave cognitive psychologists a head start on the issue. The first one, the definitional approach, determines membership by asking if an object meets the definition or inclusion criteria of a concept. An often spread anecdote is that in philosophy classes, you will be asked, what is the essence of a chair? So, define the concept, and if a thing fits a concept, it gets that concept's name. Quickly search in Google, a chair is a thing that has four legs and you can sit on it, the backrest is optional. So, your monoblock chair? A chair. A stool-like thing with four legs and an almost non-existent backrest? Living on the balance, but we can say chair. What about that fancy cardboard chair that can be folded like an origami crane? You can see how fast this approach fails. We're not good at defining things. Often, we can point to things and quickly decide if it's part of a category or not. But we can't exactly specify what everything of a category shares, so our definition is always incomplete. And so, we resorted to pointing and comparing, 
trying to figure out what features truly define a concept. In the prototype approach, we take the category member most representative of the concept, which we call the prototype, and compare how similar another thing is to it. So, we take the chair yes of all chairs, apologies for the weird term, and take other things, chair or otherwise. So, if the comparison object looks like our prototype chair, we say that the object is a chair. The more that it differs from our prototype, the more difficult it is to determine its chairness. Or, as the saying goes, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. The problem is that in the grand scheme of chairs, we would run into a chair that we know with all our hearts as a chair, but looks almost nothing like our prototype. That fancy cardboard chair may look nothing like a monoblock chair, but we wouldn't hesitate to call both of them chairs. So, the exemplar approach built up on prototypes. We do the same comparing process, but we use more types of chairs which we call exemplars, or members of the category representing the concept that we have encountered in the past, to establish the chairness of an object we're investigating. The good thing about exemplars is that because we have more comparison points, we're able to extend membership to more cases, even if they're unusual or exceptional. Simply, prototypes are useful when we want to give a quick description of an average example of a category, while exemplars help us expand the bounds of what things fall into each of the categories in our conceptual knowledge library. However, the trade-off is that prototypes allow us to make faster judgments, while exemplars permit more accurate categorizations at the expense of processing time and resources. Now that we can put things into boxes, psychologists decided to make things harder. Apparently, concepts like Matroishka dolls are nested across levels. Categories can be found within categories of different specificities. The hierarchical organization perspective introduces three terms which will make sense in a while. Basic level concept are the terms we use to call an individual object. This is the level of specificity we've been using for prototypes and exemplars. Cats, chairs, ducks, and dogs are examples of basic level concepts. At one level of specificity above the basic level concept, are the superordinate or global concepts which represent the overall category to which basic level concepts belong. So, cats and dogs belong to the superordinate animal group, while liberty and freedom of speech belong to the superordinate Bill of Rights in the Philippine Constitution. Going one level below basic level concepts are the subordinate or specific concepts, which are subtypes like specific species, titles, or subfields, depending on what your basic level is. So. Stools and rocking chairs are subordinates to chair, and rubber duck, daffy duck, and Donald duck are specific subordinate instantiations of duck. An important thing to note is that we lose more information going upward into the superordinate level than we gain information going down to the subordinate level. That's because each level going down already rules out a lot of variability. Duck types share more things in common under a basic level duck than cats, dogs, and ducks do as members of the superordinate category, animal. Eventually, two more approaches built up on the findings from hierarchical organization by specifying what exactly connects superordinate, basic level, and subordinate concepts, as well as how categories are interconnected. In the semantic network approach, concepts are represented by nodes and the connections between levels by links. The links are important because, aside from connecting concepts across levels of specificity, they also indicate what characteristics or relationships actually bind them. For example, if we take the superordinate category fruit, all of the more specific basic level types of fruit below it share the common characteristic that fruits are the edible flowering part of their respective plants. Below fruit, we can draw links toward basic level examples such as apple and banana. Again. There are subordinate examples below these specific types of fruit. For example, we have Macintosh apples and Granny Smith apples, or Lakatan Natundan and Saba as local variants of the banana. Notice that these subtypes still share characteristics. Apples tend to have crisp textures and give out juice when eaten, while bananas have tough exteriors which have to be peeled so we can eat the soft interior. Still, these specific subtypes have their own features such as green versus red or sweet versus tart apples, and long versus short or readily eaten versus cook at first bananas. Essentially, each level of a semantic network introduces ever more specific concepts 
as well as correspondingly more specific characteristics that allow us to discriminate between them. But because of cognitive economy, more general characteristics are noted at more global levels of the network because we assume that everything subordinate possesses those features and we only add more specific descriptors as needed to discriminate between subtypes. Meanwhile, connectionism or parallel distributed processing was developed through insights from computer science and neuroscience to help us understand how we process knowledge at the level of neurons. The workings of this model are complex, but a good way to think of them is that they more or less follow the hierarchical structure of concepts assumed by semantic networks, just that we add weights to the links between nodes to indicate the strength of their connections. In addition, concepts are processed across large networks of neurons that represent them in terms of dimensions such as living, non-living, as in the sensory functional hypothesis, large libraries of properties and attributes, as in the multiple factor approach, survival value in the semantic category approach, or activation of areas integrated in the brain, like in the hub and spoke model, such as those responsible for action in the embodied approach. Categories can help us process information more efficiently. Now that we understand how concepts work, we've learned that even if the surrealists, cubists, and abstract expressionists had a different view of what art should represent, they show that concepts are not fixed but actually depend on the purposes and intentions that would best serve us. It's what allows physicians to identify which parts of the body to operate on, which blood vessels or nerves could be affected by a procedure. It's how quality assurance inspectors know which products are good for sale and which ones to throw out. It's the difference between a driver with an out-of-control car to crash into a pole and not a person. Because of this, some people need more specific basic levels to fit their expertise needs. A regular person would look at the street and spot cars, while a passenger waiting for a rideshare or a car enthusiast might have to specify between car brands. A car dealer or avid buff might go down to the level of year and make. So, conceptual knowledge relies on both fixed characteristics of things, as well as our knowledge, which determines the level of specificity and interconnectedness at which our concepts are defined. It really depends on what will serve our purposes. But what happens when something really belongs to and well represents a category? First, it has high family resemblance, such that it looks and functions like the other members of its category. So, chairs high in chairness would look like and function like other chairs, because they share a lot of things with each other. Next, it has high typicality. Remember that since exemplars differ in the extent to which they represent the average prototype member, people are better able to identify a category member the more that it resembles the prototype. A good chair must look like the cherryest chair, and so it will be judged more quickly as a chair. So your typical four feet with backrest chair would outchair, in terms of the action time, an avant-garde thing that the artist dared call a chair. As a consequence, Objects that are highly typical of a category are more frequently given as examples due to naming effects. If you're asked for a chair, you're more likely to grab the humble yet reliable monoblock chair, given its abundance in Philippine spaces, while fancier couches and sofas, though still chair-ish, are less accessible and less representative of a chair category. Finally, priming in hierarchical and semantic networks for spreading activation and parallel distributed processing is similar to what we discussed in memory. Presentation of a good member of a category speeds up our ability to respond to and identify other members when they're also given to us. That is, if I now ask you to give examples of animals, you're likely to say cats, ducks, or dogs because you've been primed by how we kept on mentioning these members of category animal. By looking at apples, art, bananas, chairs, cats, ducks, dogs, and democracy, we learn that we organize information in our memory system by using conceptual knowledge, made possible through concepts, categories, and categorization. Then, we looked at four approaches to categorization in psychological research with a brief introduction to neuroscientific and computer science alternatives. Ultimately, what gives a chair its chairness or any category its definitiveness is not the thing itself, but the people who think and talk about these things. A concept gains meaning because, whether by intention or by chance, people agree to call it by its name. And such is the connection of knowledge with language, which is our topic next time. See you then!